Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. This is Unapologetic Skincare and Beauty. I'm Stephanie and this is Mystery Monday. So every single week on Monday I post a video about an unsolved mystery, usually a murder, disappearance of some kind, something that kind of leaves me wanting more information, something that left me either impacted in a way of being you know, really saddened by it or impacted in a way of my curiosity being you know, peaked to the point where I wanted to learn more. Thank you guys for being here. As always, I know this is a beauty and a skincare channel, but I am super interested in, you know, true crime and stuff, and it seems like there's some of you out there who are as well, so I'm gonna keep doing these. Today's case that we're talking about is extremely sad and confusing. There's so many questions about why. Why did this happen? What was the point? Whenever there's an issue of violence towards children, I'm always left with this awful sick feeling like, why? Why would, why would you do something like that? Who would do something like that? So let's hop right into this case and talk about the Tan Children Murders, also known as the Geylang Baru Family Murders. One early morning in January 1979, the fates and lives of an entire family in Singapore would be changed forever. The Tan family lived in the Geylang Bahru neighborhood in Kalan, Singapore. The two parents were named Tan Kun Chai and his wife was Li Mei Ying and they had four children ranging from ages 5 to 10. There was three boys, Tan Kok Peng, aged 10, Tan Kok Hin, aged 8, Tan Kok Soon, aged 6, and the youngest girl, Tan Chin Ni, and she was five. Although they were a larger family and they lived in very close quarters, the people who knew them described them as being a happy family, very close. The parents loved the children very much, as most parents do. They tried to do a lot of things together as a family, and they were just described as a really happy, nice family. The children were well behaved. They played together nicely. There was no issues. Nobody seemed to have any problems with this family. The entire family lived in a one-bedroom apartment, and it was at BLK 58. Now, I don't know if it's pronounced Block 58 or if it's BLK 58, um, because I'm not familiar with the area. The three boys attended Bendemeer Road Primary School, and little Chin Ni was still in kindergarten. Tan and Lee, the parents, their sole income they derived from a mini bus that they had purchased and they ran it as a school bus. So they brought other children to school every morning, seven days a week. And while they were doing that, their, their own four children would be at home and be responsible for getting themselves up in the morning, getting themselves ready for school and getting themselves off to school. Because of, the, because of the nature of the school bus business, the parents, they had to get up very early and leave the house very early. So on the morning of January 6th, they got up as usual and they left the house about 6.35 a.m. When they left the house, all four children were still sleeping, but as usual, their mother called the apartment around 7.10 a.m. to make sure that they were up and getting ready for school and so that they wouldn't be late for school. When she called this morning though, there was no answer at the apartment. She tried several more times and still received no answer. When she was thoroughly worried that the children weren't up and were gonna miss you know, their own school days, she called a neighbor and asked the neighbor if she could go over and knock on the door and wake the kids up or see if they were getting ready. The neighbor did go over to the Tan's apartment, knocked on the door, but she says she didn't hear anything inside the apartment, that it was pretty much quiet. So she must have just assumed that the kids had gotten up and, and left the house as usual and were off to school. Tan and Lee arrived home that morning around 10 a.m., which was usual, to find the apartment completely quiet. Um, I think that they probably assumed the kids had gone off to school like normal and it wasn't until their mother went into the bathroom where she found all four of her children's bodies stacked on top of each other on the bathroom floor. All four of the children had been brutally murdered. They were dressed in their school clothes which indicated that they had gotten themselves up 
and began getting ready for school um, and they I can only imagine that what she walked in on in that bathroom was a parent's worst nightmare. I can't imagine ever getting over something like that or unseeing what she saw. Because it's bad enough to lose a child to illness or an accident, but to see all four of your children brutally murdered, stacked on top of each other on a floor like they were nothing, it would just, it would, it would end me. So I can't imagine going through that and kind of ever being the same afterwards. Each child reportedly had a minimum of 20 slash wounds to their faces and bodies. The little five-year-old girl, Chin Ni, appeared to have taken the majority of the slash wounds to her face. And the children's older and eldest brother, Tan Kok Pang, was thought to have fought back against the assailant or assailants because his right arm had been almost severed and several long strands of hair were found in his right hand. I can only imagine that he was trying to protect his younger siblings from what was happening to them. The local police did feel that the murders had been premeditated. There was no sign of forced entry. The apartment wasn't ransacked or gone through. Nothing was missing. Nothing was taken. And, you know, the lock hadn't been broken on the door. This person or persons had been let in by the children, which indicated to the investigators that the children knew and felt comfortable with the person that had come into the apartment and ended their lives. The police also felt that these people or this person must have known the Tan family and been aware and familiar with their comings and goings as after they committed the murders, they stayed for a pretty good amount of time to thoroughly clean up after themselves. There was blood found obviously in the bathroom where the children were murdered and left, but in the kitchen sink, which indicated to the police that the assailant or assailants had stayed after to clean off what must have been a lot of blood on their, their own selves or their own persons. So they found blood in the kitchen sink and that indicated to the police that these people weren't really in any rush to kind of get out that it wasn't one of those things where they just busted in, killed the kids, and then they were like, get out of here, we don't know when these people are gonna be home. That they knew when the parents were going to be returning, so they knew how long they had to kind of cover their tracks. The murder weapon was determined to be a dagger and a chopper that were missing from the Tan's kitchen, and neither of those weapons was ever recovered or found. A woman was questioned who lived in their building and they called her Granny and she was usually sitting in the hallway and she would sit out in the hallway basically from morning until night and watch the kids play. All the kids that lived in like the neighborhood or the apartment building, she would sit in the corridor and watch them all play and you know, she was kind of like a grandmother figure. She would just sit there and watch them. and. Um, everybody thought that if anybody would see somebody entering or leaving the Tan's apartment, it would be Granny because that was pretty much her post, like sitting there in that hallway. She would be able to see the comings and goings of anyone that day in going into that apartment. But, unluckily enough, that day Granny said that she was not sitting in the hallway because she had chosen to wash her hair. Um, so that was a dead end. A taxi driver did come forward saying that he picked up a passenger that morning. The taxi driver says he picked up a man in his 20s at about 8 a.m. that same morning and it was right around the same area as their apartment building and he says the man was kind of not covered in blood but had blood on his clothes and he also had a knife that was in his pocket and he knew that he had a knife because when he got into the car it banged on the taxi cab's door. Aside from those two people, there was another person, I think at some point, from a different apartment building that it claimed he or she had seen the older son uh, wrestling with an assailant through the window. But that lead turned out to be a hoax, you know, it was basically just fake news, like somebody was just, I don't know, it sounds so bad to say a hoax, like who would joke about that? Who would, 
who would get in the way of, of an investigation trying to find the murderers of four innocent children? I don't know, but I guess they did. So that information was thrown out and wasn't taken into consideration during the investigation. Um, about two weeks after the children's deaths, the Tan family received a Chinese New Year card. On the card, there was a picture of happy children playing together, and there was a horrific message written inside that said, now you can have no more offspring. Ha ha ha. This was traumatic for the Tans, not only because they had lost all of their children just recently. After the birth of her last daughter, Lee Mei had become sterilized so that she wouldn't get pregnant again. And this may seem like something weird to you, but you have to keep in mind the political environment in Singapore at that time. Um, that's very important and I'll go into that in a second. But So they had lost their four children and couldn't conceive any more children. And now they receive a postcard that says, in a gleeful manner, now you can't have any more children, ha 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 ha. And it was signed, the murderer. So this person knew that the Tans couldn't get pregnant again. And it wasn't really, I don't think, public information. It would have had to be somebody that they knew and shared that information with, which just reinforced to the police and the investigators that this was somebody close to the Tan family. Additionally, in this card, the Tans were referred to as A Chai and A Eng, which were their personal nicknames that only someone who knew them would be aware of, or somebody they were close to and friendly with. There's really no evidence that the person who sent this postcard was the murderer or connected to the murderers at all. It could just be somebody who, you know, another hoax kind of thing, like trying to throw police off or just mess around with the case, trying to rub salt in the tan's wounds, though why you would want to do that to somebody, I don't know, but people are crazy and disruptive and problematic at times and in this case like all other cases you will find people like that but it was signed the murderer so i don't know it could just be somebody messing around or it could actually have been the murderer so here are the theories there was only really two theories that i found in my research that i thought were legitimate and possible as as always with these cases there's a lot of nonsense theories floating around um, and I didn't want to dig too deeply into those theories because I truly believe it's one of these theories. And I won't tell you which one right away, but I think you'll figure it out as we're going through them. So the first theory is the uncle theory. So there was a man who lived in the apartment complex with them, or the apartment building with the Tans, and the children called him uncle. So he was very familiar to the children and he would use the Tan's phone almost every day because he didn't have one of his own. The theory is that this man would always give the Tan's money every week to play his numbers in the lottery. They would be out and about and they would buy his ticket for him, play his numbers for him, and then he would watch the TV to see if he had won. So one week his numbers actually won in the lottery and he was obviously very excited because, you know, this is not a wealthy part of Singapore. These people, you know, they have, the Tans had four children and they had to live in a one bedroom apartment. They weren't rolling in money. So to win in the lottery was pretty much something that would happen once in a lifetime. So he was very excited. He ran over to the Tans, you know, to get his winnings and was told by the Tans that they had forgotten to purchase his tickets that week and there was no winnings to be handed over so he was clearly really upset and angry by that um and when the tans purchased their minibus to start their their school bus business so this kind of confirmed in uncle's crazy frenzied paranoid mind that the Tans had in fact played his numbers, that they had gotten the winnings and that they kept his money for themselves and just told him they'd forgotten to buy the ticket. So he was pissed, pretty much, he was angry. Um, so that gives Uncle motive, right? So now he has motive. Add to that, that Uncle was put into a lineup where the taxi driver picked him out of a lineup of other men and said that he was the one who had boarded his taxi that morning of the children's murders 
with blood on his clothes and a knife or weapon of some sort in his pocket. He was held for two weeks, but for some reason was never charged with anything. I guess they didn't have enough evidence to keep him and Shortly after he was released from the jail, he left the area with his sister and nobody's ever really heard from him again. So another YouTuber covered this case and the person who brought this theory to light was somebody who was familiar with the area or whose parents was familiar with the area. So I will just read the comment that they replied to this YouTuber's video and I'll also post the link to this video because I think that she was the first person to cover this case on YouTube. And I'll place a link to her video in the description box. I watched so many of these true crime sort of missing persons videos that I forget her name, I feel terrible, but I will find it and put it in the description box. This theory had come to light when a commenter on the video replied this. I live in Singapore and my mom lived at Geylang Bahru when she was young. This is what she told me, she said, Everyone in the area knows it was their uncle who murdered the kids. The parents were supposed to buy some 4D local lottery where you bet on four numbers for the uncle. When the number the uncle picked came up as winning, he went over to his hands to collect his money, but was told by them that they had forgotten to buy the lottery for him. He was angry and didn't believe them. When the Tans bought the mini school buses to operate their transport business, it confirmed in his mind that they had kept his winnings to themselves. So he murdered their kids as a revenge to end their bloodline as he knew Mrs. Tan had sterilization done. In East Asian culture, not having an offspring to continue your bloodline is a family shame. And he knew the kids would open the door for him when he visits like they often do. As for why Mr. and Mrs. Tan would not report the uncle is apparently they were involved in drug activities and the uncle is in a street gang. If the Tans were to report the uncle to the police, he might rat them out and they would get arrested. Dealing drugs in Singapore gets you the death penalty even till this day. No neighbors would report the uncle for fears of being target of a gang, which explains why no one is willing to provide any information to the police, and also that granny so happened to be washing her hair. That's a lot of information. That's a lot of stuff. Um, a lot of things were brought up in that, in that comment that people hadn't considered before, but uncle was picked out of a lineup for being the person who got in the taxi with bloody clothes and a knife. This whole story makes sense because why else would you kill the kids other than anger and revenge? It also makes sense that the kids would have let him in since they were familiar with him. It makes sense that he would have known about their inability to have any more children because of how close he was to the family. And um, yeah, that's kind of the most believable theory at this point, but nobody knows where this guy is and nobody ever said a word against him. I don't know about the Tans being involved in drugs and I'm not trying to sit here and say that they were or they were not because I don't know. Um, is it possible? Sure, anything is possible. Is it possible this uncle guy was in a street gang? Sure, anything is possible. I only, I only say what I know and then what I believe and I do believe that this guy is probably the culprit and it just makes me sad that he got away. The second theory that's kind of been circulating around the internet is this illegal tontine scheme that the Tans were a part of. So Mrs. Tan's brother informed the investigators that the Tans were involved in an illegal tontine scheme and that he thought maybe somebody that was also involved with the scheme would be angry with them about something and you know, as a result, target and attack them. Tontine is basically a form of an investment. A group of people agree to put forth a sum of money into a pot each investor receives annual dividends on the capital invested. If an investor dies, his or her share is divided among the remaining investors, and this process continues until only one investor is still alive. So it's basically like an incredibly morbid game of musical chairs. Only one chair left, and then that person gets the pot. Depending on how many people were uh, still left alive in the Tans Tantin, I guess it would make the theory more or less plausible, but at the same time, I don't understand the point in killing the children. It's not as if the Tantine would pass on to the next generation if the Tans, you know, died, because then it would never end and nobody would ever get the money. So I, I looked everywhere, looking into Tantines and seeing if in any situation that your Tantine share or investment would pass on to your next of kin if you if you would die. And I don't believe it does because then it would be, it, it would make no sense. Everybody would just keep passing it on and nobody would ever get that big pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. So so there would be really no motivation for anybody in that Tantine to kill the children. It would have been more 
plausible or it would make more sense if, if it was a related to the Tan team that they would kill the Tans instead. That's why I don't, I don't believe that this theory is the reason. I don't believe it had anything to do with it. To me, the most plausible scenario, the most plausible theory is it was this uncle character. He killed the kids because... <laughs> So tell me when you're talking about murders and the minute I said he killed the kids, something upstairs literally just fell down and it made a really loud noise and nobody's here about me. Like my husband's outside building a playground. Nobody is upstairs. I'm shook. I'm like sweating. I'm like sweating. That scared the crap out of me. Okay, I guess we should go on. I don't I don't typically believe in like ghosts and stuff. It sounds so stupid to talk about it, but it happened right as I was saying uncle killed the children and I wonder <laughs> if it was like a ghost of one of the kids knocking something down to let me know that that's the right theory. Okay, I guess we should keep going. <sighs> to me, the only plausible theory is that this uncle character is the one who murdered the kids because he left the area shortly thereafter he would have had a motive if the whole lottery thing was correct and uh, I'm so shook right now and um, and he was picked out of a lineup by a cab driver that he was in the area that morning with blood and a weapon okay let's move on the four children were laid to rest on January 7th 1979 they were buried with some of their most loved toys and belongings it's really sad because you you see their their graves and their tombs, um, whatever you want to call it, and there's toys there, you know, that they they most loved in life. Little animals and toys that you know, if you're a parent, you see your own children playing with things similar, and it just it absolutely breaks your heart looking at their little faces their innocent little faces, it breaks your heart to not only know that their lives were ended so soon that they didn't get to experience life, but to know how it happened so brutally and heartlessly and painfully, it breaks my heart and it makes me so angry. After burying their children, the Tans couldn't continue to run their school bus business. They just said they couldn't stand being around other children pretty much at that point. You know, other people's children. Um, they were distracted and constantly missing their kids. And Mr. Tan said he didn't want to put other people's kids in danger by being distracted and not having his head and his heart there completely. So they, um, they, they closed their business and they both started working at a plastics factory, I believe. They tried so hard to adapt because they wanted to have another child to share their life with and their love. They loved children and they felt such an emptiness in their lives. After they lost their four children, they kept their apartment exactly the same. Their school bags still sitting under the table as they were that morning that they were murdered and they got up to go to school. Their clothes still in drawers and closets, their toys and belongings still around the apartment. It became a shrine to their kids and you know they didn't want to change anything, but they did want to bring some life back into that apartment, which I can imagine is crazy to me. I don't know, I know it's very hard to move in Singapore. Most people are not, most people aren't financially capable of just moving around in Singapore. You're kind of lucky if you get housing and you kind of keep what you have. So I understand that, that they couldn't move. Um, they wanted to bring another child back into the home and, and I give them a lot of credit because I just feel like I would have been broken inside so That's great that they felt they had something left to give to another child 
but they couldn't adapt and it's so crazy they tried so hard and you know for some reason the system was so flawed and broken that they were not able to adapt so at that point the tan started going to different doctors to see about getting May's uh, sterilization reversed and doctor after doctor obviously told her no you know this is like the 1980s they were like no this isn't possible this is like a permanent procedure we're sorry so mrs. tan didn't get sterilized because she didn't want any more kids she loved kids she she got sterilized because in the 1970s there was a, a big push in the Singapore government to have women, especially women from low-income families, sterilized. So after World War II, there was basically like a birth boom in Singapore and they became overpopulated. So by the 1970s, they were starting to push this um, stop it to sort of propaganda, telling families, you know, like have two children and then that's it. Um, no more stop and to kind of enforce that they not only encourage sterilization for women but they also um, they kind of punished people who had more than two children so women wouldn't receive maternity leave for any child after their second hospitals charged higher fees for births after the second child income tax deductions would only be given for the two first two children and uh, the third, fourth, fifth, whatever, any children after the second child were given lower priorities education-wise. I think that they were also paying women to basically get sterilized, which for somebody who was struggling for money, that would be a good enough incentive to do so, especially when you already had four children to support and take care of. So they were pushing it, the government was pushing it, and you know, they had four children and kind of didn't say they wanted or didn't want more, but were being pressured to, to, to put a stop to the procreation in their family. So she did become sterilized. In the Tan's case, who would have known that the four children that they had would end up murdered senselessly and they would be left with no way to procreate and have more children, to carry on their bloodline, to carry on their name, to give their love to, because clearly they had a lot to give. I feel like most couples, after losing four children that way, would say we're done with kids. I mean, most couples would get divorced. It would be too hard. It would be too hard to get through that. But they banded together, they became closer than ever, and they had this common goal in mind where they said we're going to have another child one way or the other whether it be through adoption we figure out a way to reverse the sterilization we're going to put our heads together and figure this out and they did because there is a happy ending to this story the tans eventually met with a doctor th lean in 1981 and he conducted a sterilization reversal he told them there was no, you know, sure thing that it was going to work. Like it wasn't 100% positive that it would work. Basically, the operation rejoined the fallopian tubes that had been cut and then cauterized. So there was, I mean, I just think about what a, I mean, medical, medical advances today are so, you know, far beyond what they were in the 80s that, you know, reversing something like that today, even to me, sounds crazy. But back in 1981, it's like, oh, how would you do that? So there was no 100% guarantee. He said, I will do the best I can. I'll try it for you, which no other doctor would do, but I can't promise that this is going to work. But happily, in April of 1984, which was just three years after the reversal, the couple found out that they were pregnant. And the following December, they gave birth to a healthy baby boy. For two people who loved each other so much, because you really have to love each other, right? To go through something like this and to stay together and to stay strong. They loved each other so much. They loved their children so much. And then to have them taken away from them in such an evil way. For them to be able to overcome such a big obstacle, so many big obstacles. And eventually have another child of their own to give their love to. To have a family and be a family with. It's just a sign to me that even in the darkest hours of your life, there can still be, you know, a light and a hope. And basically, 
no matter how small that light at the end of the tunnel is, it's still there, right? So you just have to keep going towards it. You have trauma, you have things in your life that hurt or make it hard to get through the day. There's always the other side of that. You can get through it because you only have one life, right? We're only here on earth once. We only have this one opportunity to make it what we want it to be. So instead of letting this horrible, horrible, horrible tragedy end them and make them cold and hard and push them away from each other and other people. It brought them together. It made them literally go through the unthinkable, the unimaginable, and they did it together. You know, they got through what most people wouldn't be able to, and they achieved a pregnancy and a birth from a situation that seemed impossible. I really, really hope that someday there is some closure for the Tan children. I know that they deserve it. They really deserve that. They deserve people to remember them and that's why I think it's important for people to continue to make videos about these things, to continue to bring these stories to light, to continue to you know, push these stories that even if they happened in the 70s or the 80s or even the 50s or 40s, these people are victims. These people died senselessly. These people weren't allowed the one life they were given. And it's not fair. And we have to keep remembering them, keep bringing them to the forefront so that if anything ever does come up or anybody sees something or thinks of something or hears something, working together, we can hopefully, you know, shine a new light on these cases and maybe one day bring the victims some peace and you know, just honor their memory in a way where you're not forgotten. All right, guys, thank you so much for being here with me. This was a hard one for me, especially, uh, it was just, it was a hard one for me. So reading and looking into the case was tough. Um, I was, you know, very like emotionally affected at a lot of different times throughout investigating this. And it took me a, a little while to get through it. There was times where I had to stop reading and looking at pictures and you know I had to stop and step back and give myself a break because it was like really affecting me. Um, but I think it's good. It's good to be affected. It's good to see things like this and value you know your own children and value that your children are safe and happy and healthy and that hopefully they remain that way. Thank you so much for being here. Stay kind. Stay beautiful, and I'll see you next week for Mystery Heart Monday. Bye. And promises. I've had more than my hand.